PCN Capital Preview. I'm Francine Scherzer. Today we'll discuss the upcoming election. You can join our discussion by calling us toll free at 1 877 PA 6 5001 or text us at 717 219 4001. But first, we're joined by Berwood Yost, director of the Floyd Institute Center for Opinion Research at Franklin and Marshall College. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you, Francine. Thank you. In the poll you released last Thursday, Pennsylvanians listed the economy as the most important issue facing Pennsylvania, followed by the government, taxes, and education. Is this consistent with prior poll data uh, that you've seen released in the past year or two? It is, Francine. We've uh, obviously, since the end of the pandemic and the increase in infl inflation, uh, Pennsylvanians have consistently told us whether statewide or in a specific congressional district, as this poll was, um, the economy is the top of mind issue, primarily driven by concerns about inflation. In, when asked how respondents how they're getting along financially, 14 percent said better, 47 percent worse off and 39 percent about the same. Do you see this as a direct correlation to the question we had just discussed with uh, what issues top the priority list for them? Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, we've been asking, I mean, can, um, evaluations of the economy are driven by partisan perspectives, undoubtedly. Um, but it's been clear over the past year and a half or so that, that citizens, regardless of party, have been concerned about the economy. And they tell us that their own financial cir circumstances are worse than they were a year ago. Um, a majority of Republicans feel that, but even a lot of independents and Democrats tell us that they're worse off than they were before. So this is something we've seen for a while. It's had a direct impact on uh, President Biden's job performance ratings. Um, and it's a key part or a key element of what's going to decide the upcoming election. Let's look now at the 10th congressional race, um, which encompasses South Central Pennsylvania, including all of Dolphin County and parts of Cumberland and York counties. Um, looking at public opinion of the two candidates, Democrat Janelle Stelson has a 33 percent favorable rating, 23 percent unfavorable and 42 percent haven't heard enough. And then uh, what does what does that data tell her campaign as to what they need to do to help her be successful in the fall? Well, look, I think the, the data from this poll that was conducted in the 10th Congressional District tells us that voters still have a lot to learn about both candidates. Janelle Stelson's a first time candidate, as you know. Uh, she spent a lot of time on the local television news um, as an anchor. And so she's relatively well known for a first time candidate. But there are still a lot of people, about 44 percent, who tell us they just don't know enough about her to have an opinion. Um, on the other side is Representative Perry, the uh, the long-term incumbent here, even 20% of voters say they don't know uh, enough about him to have an opinion. And there are specific questions that we asked in the poll about um, the, the circumstances of the candidates, certain things that they voted for, certain characteristics that they have. And it's pretty clear that voters have a lot to learn about both of these candidates. And so, you know, I think the, the key for both Perry and for Janelle in the coming uh, uh, six months before the election, five months before the election, is to increase the positive feelings that voters have about them. I think one of the things that's clear in this polling data is that the representation, how well voters in this congressional district feel they're being represented is going to be the key issue. Um, and whichever candidate can express that best, I think is going to win. Now let's look at the, the favorability ratings for Scott Perry. You'd kind of referenced those a moment ago, 39% favorable, 41% unfavorable, and 18%, as you'd mentioned, have not heard enough. Um, incumbent Scott Perry's unfavorability is 2% higher than his favorability. What are viewers finding um, that they take issue with with the congressman? Well, look, the, the big issue, I, mean, I think the thing that's important to understand it is that this race is about the incumbent, Scott Perry. And people are going to judge um, him on his performance in office. And right now, those people who say they're voting for Janelle Stelson, many of them tell us they're voting against Scott Perry. That's primarily because of his role in um, not certifying Pennsylvania's electoral votes in 2020 and because of his role in the January 6th um, proceedings. Uh, so there are a lot of people who say that Perry is the issue and they're not going to vote for him because of those 
things. On the other side, there are a lot of people who are supporting Perry. You say, hey, I like him. He's represented us well, and he stands for things I stand for. So uh, I think at the, at the end of the day, um, Francine, this race is going to come down to evaluations of how well Perry represents the district. And if people don't think he's doing a good job, whether Janelle Stelson is a viable alternative to him. Let's skip ahead now and look at the presidential race. Um, Joe Biden's favorability is 36 percent. His unfavorability is 62 percent. And for Donald Trump, uh, voters find uh, 42 percent favorable, 55 percent unfavorable. How did we end up with two candidates that people sent, tend to find more unfavorable than not? It's, <laughs> I think a lot of voters are asking themselves that same question. In fact, when you look either statewide or in this congressional district, there are about one in five voters who say, I don't like either candidate. And so, um, you know, this is one of the things that's going to make this election so um, uncertain is what happens to those voters who have to make a choice and don't like either candidate. And, um, you know, I think in this district, uh, Pres former President Trump beat Hillary Clinton handily in 2016. He beat uh, President Biden by about four points in 2020. I think everybody expects that he will win in this district once again. The question is, what will the margins be? And are there any places where uh, President Biden can make some inroads? I'm not sure. And a lot of that may depend, Francine, on whether or not um, Robert Kennedy's on the ballot, because clearly he's a spoiler here. And I think the broader picture is the more candidates there are on the ballot, the more third party candidates, um, that's going to make some difference. And it will matter who they are and how many of them are. Farwood Yost, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Nice to see you. Thanks. More of the PCN Capital Preview after the short break. Welcome back. Our guests today are Allison Dagnus, Professor of Political Science at Shippensburg University, and Chris Bork, Director of the Muhlenberg College Institute of Public Opinion. Chris, we'll start with you. Uh, we began this program speaking with Burwood Yost about some recent numbers that came out from Franklin and Marshall College, and I know you conduct polls yourself. Uh, how much value do you place on polling data when you're five months away from the general election? Uh, good morning, Francine. You know, of course, five months is a long time in politics. Um, many, many things could happen and uh, intervening uh, factors can change a race. Uh, that being said, uh, we, we often see the dynamics of a race, the kind of fundamentals established fairly early um, in campaigns. Uh, voters start to solidify uh, perceptions of, of candidates, of issues. Um, and so while they are certainly not perfectly predictive of what's going to happen in November, polls early in a year, even five months, six months out, often give us a pretty good sense of the race. So um, you take them for what they're worth, like any poll. Um, they, they give you a, a picture of what might be happening in, uh, in a particular race, some of the dynamics going on, uh, and even ones that are early can be insightful about where the broader uh, nature of a race is headed. Allison, your thoughts on polling data, particularly several months out? Oh, I mean, I, I defer to Chris, who is the expert mm -hmm. on these things. I would only just add that because we are so polarized right now, um, it, moving people's solidified opinions is, is really kind of tough. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that while a lot is going to happen, um, you know, it's some of this is just baked in the cake. And so what we see now, I think, is going to be the imprimatur for what's going to what's going to happen. It's the margins, really, that are super important. Let's start out by talking about the presidential race. It's been roughly two weeks since Donald Trump's been convicted of 34 felony charges. What does this mean for the presidential race? Well, you know, going back to some of the polling stuff, we've seen that Donald Trump's numbers have slipped nationally and in Pennsylvania, but just by a tiny little bit. Um, and furthermore, that Biden's numbers have not grown at all. Um, and so right now, the, the national polling outfits that do the, the averages have Trump up nationally, which we know because of the battleground states, mm -hmm. you know, is less of a um, harbinger of things to come than anything else. But he's up by about a point. And in Pennsylvania, he's up by about a point and a half. And so... I think that some of the focus groups that I've been listening to have said, 
well, you know, I thought that if Trump was convicted, it would change, but this really wasn't, this was more of a business thing, and so maybe not that big a deal. And it just increasingly looks like this is going to be the only case out of the four criminal cases that's going to be adjudicated before Election Day. So I think that casts even further doubt on to the effect that this uh, verdict is going to have. Chris, what role do you think the verdict will have in the election? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with it, with Allison. Um, the, the polling evidence suggests that there has been a very modest decline in support for Trump. Um, nothing dramatic, uh, as uh, as Allison was referring to, I think, because people are so established already in terms of their views of these candidates, it's hard to move them. Uh, the nature of that case um, kind of are already um, baked in. Views on the candidates uh, weren't likely to move things dramatically, and it doesn't appear that way. The one caveat, and I think Allison alluded to this uh, earlier, place like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, states that are so close, both in the polling uh, in this particular cycle and looking back to both 2020 and 2016, um, modest things can be incredibly impactful. Um, we'll see if something like this case, and again, it, this one is five months out, how will that hold all the way through the uh, the fall, could be pretty um, impactful on the, on the outcome of, of the race. Again, lots of little things are going to matter uh, in Pennsylvania. Not that this is a little thing historically, it's, it's of course quite meaningful, uh, but in terms of electoral uh, impact, if, even if it does move the dial just a, 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 an, an inch, um, it could have an impact. What can you gather by looking at the public appearances of particularly presidential candidates? For example, Joe Biden's been in Pennsylvania several times in, you know, just since the beginning of the year. Um, many of those visits to the Philadelphia region. Um, President, uh, former President Trump has been here as well, but not as frequently yet. What does that tell you just looking at where they're going and how frequently they're appearing? Yeah, it, it tells you everything about Pennsylvania, Francine. Uh, I, I, I um, reticent when I'm out giving talks about predicting uh, outcomes, predicting what's going to happen. Uh, one thing I can predict is the candidates covet Pennsylvania in such an enormous way uh, that they're going to give every bit of attention that they can to the state. We've seen that from President Biden's uh, regular appearances uh, in the Commonwealth. Uh, we'll see that with, with former President Trump, who will be back time and time again. Uh, throughout the year, our 19 electoral votes um, are are the biggest, if you will, of of the swing states. I think both candidates realize uh, its its significance to get to 270 in terms of electoral votes, and so I would be shocked, uh, totally shocked, <laughs> if if these candidates don't give everything, and that means coming here, having surrogates come to the state, spending enormous amounts of money, which they already are on ad buys in the Commonwealth. Um, it, it's, it is the one sure thing, I think, um, in this, this particular presidential election cycle. Yeah, building on, on what Chris said, um, it, we are going to be deluged by ads. We are just going to be <laughs> drowning in ads. Um, we already are, and it's just going to get exponentially worse. Uh, so if you don't like political ads, we have some very bad news for you. Um, I, was, uh, I was sort of surprised to read that Donald Trump opened his first office in Pennsylvania last week mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. And that felt, I don't know, Chris, what did you think? I thought that that was a little late um, I know that Joe Biden has more than one office in Pennsylvania and has really made, because it's his home state, you know, he's made it his uh, his sort of mission to come back here quite frequently. Um, I don't know, Chris, did that surprise you? Yeah, Allison, that's a, it's a great point and could be one of those key factors in a race that we already discussed as being so close and so competitive. Uh, Biden has, has dozens of offices, right, and is mm -hmm. staffed and is moving uh, in terms of his focus on uh, on Pennsylvania. And as you mentioned, uh, former President Trump has just opened his first office in Philadelphia, which is really interesting. We might want to discuss uh, some of the impacts of, of, of his efforts in uh, in the city of brotherly love. Uh, but but it, it, one of the things that I think is going to be key uh, in this race uh, is getting voters out, mm -hmm. uh, mobilizing voters, getting them to the to the polls. And this is, might be one of the advantages that, that Biden has. 
Um, Biden has a structural advantage, as we talked about, putting those uh, offices into the field, um, getting individuals, um, you know, into a structure that can can lead to uh, getting voters to, to turn out. Um, we see in the polls that people that are tend to be more likely voters, historically uh, active voters, uh, do have a little bit of an edge for uh, President Biden. Uh, when we expand the poll or our polls to look at, at less likely voters, that's where Trump starts to perform better uh, in the polls. Um, and therefore, it's crucial for those casual voters, if you will, um, to, to do all you can to get them out because they're harder to get out compared to super voters or regular voters. And uh, Trump's lack of organization, at least to date, um, could be problematic in that case. Um, I think he, he's got lots of work to do in Pennsylvania to put those uh, structural elements in place uh, to make sure that he could reach some of those voters that I think are going to be necessary for him uh, to win Pennsylvania, uh, unlike 2020. You know, just to add on to that, um, because this is increasingly looking like a mobilization election than a persuasion election, um, I think it's really worth remembering that because both Biden and Trump are essentially incumbents, you know, um, there's really no room to define anyone anymore. And so going back to where we started, uh, the idea that anybody is persuadable now, you know, maybe, uh, but really it's going to be a matter of mobilization, especially because sentiment among um, a lot of people against both of these folks is that they're not the most popular presidential candidates we've ever seen. So it's really going to be about uh, getting the folks back home. If you're a Democrat, if you're a Republican, we really are going to ask you to go ahead and go out on Election Day, even if you don't want to. And that's about mobilization. I want to look at, uh, refer back to that Franklin and Marshall poll data that was released last week, particularly with the presidential race uh, in a in a potential lineup. uh, Joe Biden receives 38 percent of the vote. Donald Trump, 44 percent. Jill Stein, 2 percent. Robert Kennedy, 10 percent. So talk a little bit about the role of third party candidates and what kind of impact you see them having moving forward. Chris, we'll come to you first. Yeah, Francine, uh, it it touches on a little bit of of, uh, what Allison was talking about. These candidates are not viewed very favorably, uh, both in our polling, uh, Burwood's uh, Franklin and Marshall poll, other polls have shown that a majority of of Pennsylvanians um, have unfavorable views of both candidates. Um, And there is that overlay that now um, becoming very uh, much talked about group of double haters Mm -hmm. or those that have unfavorable views of both Biden um, and Trump. Um, And they become they become crucial um, because what what do you do if you don't like either of them? Certainly those candidates, a lot of those individuals might revert upon classic uh, cues that we have such as, as partisanship will return to, hey, OK, Trump's are R, uh, I usually vote Republican. I'm going to end up there again or Biden's a Democrat. Um, but some of those individuals um, might decide uh, that they're looking for alternatives if you don't like either of the two major party candidates. And that's why we see as, as those numbers that you just cited, someone like RFK Jr., Uh, who the public doesn't know all that much about. He has the most iconic of political names, but not necessarily uh, a lot of um, public understanding of who he is and his background and what he stands for. He he gets double digit numbers in polls. Our poll last poll uh, a month ago had him. I think we were we were definitely an outlier on this, but we had him well into the high um, teens in terms of of his numbers, which gives us a sense that can't. Uh, voters are looking for alternatives or looking for um, something other than the two major party candidates. And the other big question will be, and this goes back to what Allison was was discussing earlier, is mobilization, turnout. Mm-hmm. Can you get uh, individuals that aren't energized about either candidate to turn out? And is one of the two uh, parties, or in this case, campaigns, uh, better at doing that? And that might be crucial in Pennsylvania. In the primary, some progressive Democrats that consider themselves pro-Palestine cast what they call a uh, protest vote against Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. What role do you think they'll have when we get to the general election? You know, those protest votes, especially in Michigan, which I think we saw a really significant number there, um, those are spots of worry for the Biden campaign. Um, I don't know necessarily opportunity for the Trump campaign. And I think that one really important 
element of the five month period that we have right now is that we're going to be getting a lot more information in the next five months meaning we're going to find out a lot more about RFK Jr. Um, because Chris is right, that iconic name will carry him far, but, but probably not over the, over the finish line. And because Donald Trump has really been occupied with his trial that just concluded, um, we're going to be hearing a lot more from him. And so as the situation in the Middle East begins to, it seems maybe, quiet down, although I, I don't really want to jinx it, um, then I think what we're going to be seeing is a lot more from all of the candidates about how they're going to handle not only domestic affairs, but also international affairs. And the, the contrast is stark. Um, these are not two candidates who believe the same thing. And so as the undecided voters or the voters who are third party curious begin to, to draw these distinctions, between Biden and Trump. I think that's going to be very illustrative. Chris, do you want to comment on this voting bloc as well, the, the progressive Democrats that consider themselves pro-Palestine, those that have cast a protest vote, or perhaps those that are even critical of, say, for example, uh, current U.S. Senator John Fetterman, while he's not running for election mm -hmm. this, this year, he has a few years to go yet in his term. Is that a sign of division in the Democratic Party that, that there are certain voters that are casting these types of votes? Yeah, m m most certainly, uh, Francine. Um, and I'll keep coming back to sound like the broken record because Pennsylvania is so close and so is Michigan and, and Wisconsin, key swing states. Um, any type of erosion of a coalition uh, that a candidate has and for Joe Biden, his successful 2020 coalition of voters uh, that included progressives uh, that, that came out um, is going to be uh, impactful. And um, the, the situation in the Middle East, of, of course, um, has uh, created tensions within the Democratic Party, uh, divides that we're seeing playing out. You mentioned, you know, progressives views on on Senator Fetterman's uh, positions on the on the matter. Um, and it's it's been a challenge for Democrats. And I think Republicans are, are, have been very excited to it to expose this. You look at a state like Pennsylvania that that um, has a significant progressive uh, part of the electorate, primarily in, in urban areas like Philadelphia. Um, you have also a, a non-trivial um, uh, amount of voters um, in also in, primarily in Southeast uh, that identify as Jewish uh, and vote o overwhelmingly Democratic or at least sizably Democratic. Um, any type of, of uh, not having either of those groups aboard uh, because of divisions on this issue could be really uh, challenging uh, for Biden in the state. Again, you can't afford to lose much. Uh, and if this issue is is dividing uh, um, interest within your own coalition and maybe making people less interested in voting for you, you're going to have a challenge. So how do you how do you navigate that? Well, you got to make appeals to say, look, first of all, what I'm doing compared to what Trump will will do. How might you view that for a voter? Um, you talk about the record for progressives of things that you've done over the last few years. Biden's going to have to make the case that he's really moved forward things like um, energy, environmental policy, um, equity issues that he's he's pushed to try and, and make a case that look, I might not be perfect for you, but I'm certainly better than the alternative, and I've delivered on a number of factors. Let's talk about the issue of abortion for a moment. The Dobbs decision in 2022 was credited with helping Democrats. The U.S. Supreme Court is expected to hand down two additional abortion-related decisions this summer. Mm -hmm. How do you think that affects the election? Oh, I think that this is going to uh, jump back ahead to be ahead of mind. Um, I thought that the, the polling, the Franklin and Marshall polling about which were the most important issues in Pennsylvania, abortion wasn't in the top four. Um, and that very well might change. Certainly around the country where there are abortion laws that are on the ballot, you know, especially in swing states like Arizona and Nevada, um, all eyes are going to be on Florida, which has a very punitive abortion um, law that's going to be uh, voted on on Election Day. I think that it's going to become more of an issue and more of a galvanizing issue, especially for the Democrats, because what we've seen is that the Republicans are a little frayed 
in where they stand. Um, they are, you know, it's, a, it's an old and rather boring cliche, but they are the, the dog that caught the mail truck. Uh, so they got what they wanted, um, and now what comes next? And some of the decisions that Republican lawmakers around the country have made are these sort of very draconian measures that feel out of step, even with those who are pro-life. And so as, again, these next five months, we're gonna be learning a lot, um, as these decisions come down from the Supreme Court, as folks begin to rally, especially women, especially suburban women, especially young people, um, it's possible that the issue of the Middle East is going to retreat a little bit in folks' minds, um, and abortion's going to take that place. But, you know, five months, that's a, that's a, that's a lot of time for a lot of things mm -hmm. to happen. Chris, what role do you see abortion playing in the election? Yeah, Allison described it so so nicely. Uh, it may be a little bit lower in terms of salience in, in contemporary polls. I think Democrats are going to do everything they can to increase that saliency through the campaign uh, that happens this um, this fall. Uh, we've seen it be incredibly impactful in 2022, uh, last year in, in the fall, a lot of states uh, in referendums and, um, and kind of uh, lifting Democratic candidates across the country. Now, presidential race is a little bit different. Um, the, the top of the ticket, the two candidates that are so polarizing are going to have a lot of impact on defining the race and, and some sometimes pushing issues a little bit aside for voters because they're focusing at least on on those those candidates and what what they might perceive as some of the liabilities of, of the of the candidates. Um, but certainly, as we move towards the fall, uh, as Allison was saying so nicely, um, I, I think voters are going to be reminded continuously of why this issue is uh, uh, so important, um, what it ma why it matters. The choices are are so stark, if you will. Um, and, and Allison is right. Republicans have really been uh, pushed to try and find a, a safe harbor, if you will, on this issue. Uh, after getting what they wanted um, in terms of that decision. Um, so I'm I'm very confident uh, that it will be part of this race. Will it play the same role that it has in 2022, 2023? Probably not. But again, again, the old broken record, uh, when lots of little things matter, this is going to be one of those, and this is not reproductive rights, it's not a little thing. Um, but in terms of its impact, even if it, it, it matters uh, as the key factor that gets a few people out, um, come November could be really uh, uh, important. We'll continue our discussion in just a moment, but first I'd like to give our guests a brief break and tell you about what's coming up on PCN. The PCN Capital Preview returns tomorrow morning as we discuss the state budget with former Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governors Mark Single and Jim Cauley. That's tomorrow morning live at 9 a.m. Join us for On the Issues this week as we sit down with former presidential candidate Andrew Yang to discuss the Forward Party and its candidates for office in Pennsylvania followed by an interview with Representative Paul Schemmel to discuss his views on efforts to decriminalize marijuana in Pennsylvania. That's Wednesday night, starting at 7. If you enjoy PCN's coverage of politics and policy, sign up for our political newsletter, the PCN Capital Review. There you'll find highlights of the day's news, along with links to live event coverage and PCN original shows. To subscribe, visit PCNTV.com. Thank you for watching PCN. PCN is a 501c3 nonprofit television network that receives no government funding. We're relying on viewers and donors like you to help PCN continue to bring you everything Pennsylvania. To make a donation, visit PCNTV.com. And a reminder to our viewers, if you'd like to participate in today's discussion, you can call us toll-free at 1-877-PA-65001 or text us at 717-219-4001. Let's return to our discussion about the presidential race. Um, Donald Trump is 77, Joe Biden is 80. Does age play a factor in the presidency? Oh, uh, yes, it does. Um, I think age plays a factor, uh, not only as somebody who is president, but also very much so in campaigning, right? And. Um, my students will will sometimes ask me, you know, Joe Biden is just is so old. Uh, how could he be so old and still be president? And I think that the obvious answer is, well, he's being president uh, mm -hmm. and he's doing it rather successfully, um, according to Democrats. And um, last week there was a Wall Street Journal article that dropped that said Joe Biden is so old, he's practically uh, comatose uh, and therefore, you know, a bad a bad choice. 
And the pushback was interesting against that article because it came not only from Democrats, which would be obvious, mm -hmm. but also from politicos around D.C. who said, gee, this was weirdly sourced. And I've been in meetings with Joe Biden and he seems perfectly fine. Um, and so that was interesting. But I think that the the overall sentiment is that the, the biggest baggage that Joe Biden has is, is his age. Um, and then when uh, my dad asked me, my dad is 85, and he asked me, you know, how come Donald Trump, who's 77 and only three years behind him, doesn't get that? And I said, well, let's talk about, you know, the, the court case that has been going on. Uh, it's about paying hush money mm -hmm. to a porn star that he had a sexual relationship with. Um, that doesn't feel like an old man move. Uh, you know, there's a certain amount of, of sort of virility that's built into this. Mm -hmm. And so the contrast is there between the two of them. Um, and yet we see constantly the, the misspeaking and um, sometimes verbal gaffes from both. Mm -hmm. And whether that's a function of age or whether that's just both of them who have long, decades long histories of making verbal gaffes. I mean, I remember Joe Biden in the early 90s, uh, you know, people called him a gaffe machine. Mm -hmm. um, is that because he's older? Or is that because he's Joe Biden? You know, and, and Donald Trump will go on these sort of rants, you know, that you can't necessarily follow where he's going. Is that because he's older? Because he's Donald Trump. Um, so age is a huge factor here, but it plays out really differently with both candidates. Chris, well, both of you work with college students. Chris, what do you hear from your students? Do they feel energized at all? Or what kind of sentiment do they have about this presidential race? Uh, they're, they're not particularly energized, right? And we'll see how that changes in the fall, Francine, when people start to really concentrate and the campaigns are so... Uh, engaged in Pennsylvania and the outreach to younger voters, including those on college campuses, really kick, kicks in. Um, but that's one of the challenges. And this goes back to the discussion you were just having with, with Allison uh, uh, about the the views of the candidates as being um, distant from the many of the younger voters in the country. Uh, and, and some of that is in style. Um, you know, and, and how they they appear, how they look, how they how they talk um, that, that just lacks a connection point. And for young Democrats in particular, in fact, we we're talking about progressives, um, uh, it, how they connect with Biden, I think, is an enormous part. And I also think this is, is part of, of, of Biden's challenge. Uh, with voters of color to a degree, um, um, black voters, black men, uh, particularly as we're getting into co electoral cohorts, um, that might not see him as as vital uh, enough, enough energy and uh, enough um, um, kind of uh, oomph, if you will, uh, to get the job done. And it's a drag on him. We've seen that in our polling. Uh, in the Commonwealth about the an overwhelming number of Pennsylvanians, including many Democrats, think he's too old to run. And this is Allison was discussing that that Wall Street Journal piece um, that certainly had some, I, I think, some some uh, interesting choices made as from a journalistic perspective of who you were talking to, primarily Republicans that were going on the record. Uh, on this. And I guess, what would you expect from Republicans to say in an election year about the Democratic candidate? Um, no, nonetheless, it's 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 an issue that that Biden, I think, is going to have to to really work to uh, address. He's tried. You see some of the ads that run in Pennsylvania where he takes it head on, says I'm old. Um, and I think that that's that's a pretty good strategy. It, it actually moves people's perspectives in the end. Uh, and, and for Trump, who is not almost as old um, and is prone to some of the same gaffes that um, that uh, were just mentioned uh, earlier, uh, I think it's um, it, he's, he never has to kind of rise to that same level because he's compared to, to Biden in this case. And Biden seems to have more challenges. Allison, what do you hear from your students? And, and can you offer recommendations? What should candidates do to engage these younger voters? Um, my students, I think, very similarly to Chris's students, are really not engaged. Um, e even our majors are sort of, you know, there's, there's just a, a, a sense of ennui about this election um, that I haven't really seen before. Um, and what I think that both campaigns could do is send out more surrogates, right? Uh, not necessarily, I mean, celebrities are, are fine and great, but, but also just younger 
Democrats, younger Republicans, mm -hmm. who can speak to younger voters and say, yeah, OK, this this guy, either guy is a little old, but he's not going to be there forever. And we've got a bench. Right. Mm -hmm. I, and I think that would be tremendously successful for both of them to do that. Um, I, I don't I cannot speak for Chris's uh, place of work. Um, but I'm always shocked at how few candidates for any level of office come to my campus mm -hmm. where there's 5,000 college students and about a 50-50 split, Democrat-Republican. You know, the, the canard that young people are all liberal is, mm -hmm. is factually incorrect at Shippensburg. Um, why don't they come and ask these kids for their vote? Because that's really what voters want, right? Mm -hmm. They want to be asked. They want to be told, you're important please vote for me. Um, and so I think that having more surrogates out there, because I know the candidates can't Looking necessarily Looking back come. at maybe some current and recent public figures, who yeah. did a good job of engaging the youth vote? Oh, Josh Shapiro. Oh my gosh. Uh, Josh Shapiro, in his run for governor, had um, organizations on, I don't know if it was every college campus, but it sure was a lot of them, um, mm -hmm. and, and met with some of the leaders from each of these organizations mm -hmm. rather frequently. And that is a rush for an 18, 19, 20 year old. Um, you know, the, the guy who could be governor uh, is, is talking to me and hearing our problems and hearing our issues. Um, I think that he's done a terrific job, uh, even in office, to say, yep, we are interested in young voters too. Chris, your thoughts? No, I, I think Shapiro has done a, 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 an incredible job, both with his campaign and, and as, as Allison said, uh, with this governor's office. Uh, John Fetterman, um, you know, who mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about now, who, who certainly has some tensions with progressive element within the Democratic Party, um, had built up uh, quite a, uh, a relationship with younger voters. Um, you know, his style, his rhetoric, mm -hmm. um, his approach to politics was so different and, and continues to be so different that it really attracted uh, interest when I uh, talked with my students um, during the, the last campaign, his Senate campaign. Um, he had certainly uh, done that. And some of it is, I think, campaign efforts, too. He was savvy in social media mm -hmm. uh, candidate, uh, really um, pretty uh, adept at, at, at using those tools in ways that other candidates are, are not. I mean, they might have a team that that allows them to do it, but he was doing a lot of it himself uh, as an example. But but Allison was 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 as absolutely right. Um, it's in Pennsylvania. The, the, we're, we have one of the largest student populations, uh, college student populations in the country uh, and certainly among swing states. Uh, if, if there's not uh, a lot of effort by the campaigns to target those groups, uh, this year, it's a little bit of malpractice uh, in terms of, uh, of of the approach that's being taken because they are so crucial, I think, um, uh, and scattered throughout the state. Lots of different congressional districts. You know, uh, um, we're we're at Muhlenberg is located in the seventh congressional district, uh, which is one of the most competitive uh, of the state's um, congressional districts. You know, having outreach to students and in a big population here in the Lehigh Valley uh, seems like it, it should be key to almost any campaign. I'd like to shift our focus briefly and talk about the U.S. Senate race. Incumbent Bob Casey will be facing mm -hmm. Republican Dave McCormick. How do you see this race shaping up? You know, Francine, I think this is is again Pennsylvania. We are we are loaded a little bit. It's a little bit of a blessing and a curse <laughs> for us. We we have uh, you know of course a, a competitive presidential race. We're gonna have lots of competitive congressional races uh, throughout the uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, the House, the uh, state House is in play. The state Senate is in play, um, and the Senate race. Uh, seems by all measures to be quite competitive. And certainly for Senator Casey, who's been elected three times uh, very easily uh, in races, averaging double digit wins in his previous races, uh, this race against Dave McCormick uh, seems to be setting up as his most competitive. Polling shows that uh, Casey has leads in in all the kind of public polls that I've I've seen. Um, but those polls aren't uh, those those leads, excuse me, aren't um, uh, incredible in terms of their size. They're more mid single digit, which if if it was to hold just on that level would be um, Casey's most competitive race. Um, 
he certainly has uh, lots of attributes going in, an iconic name himself in Pennsylvania politics, uh, success um, building campaigns throughout the state, not only for U.S. Senate, but before that for state offices like Auditor General. Um, he's well financed. Uh, he is generally uh, viewed positively by Pennsylvanians in terms of um, his favorability. So he's got a lot of assets going in. But Dave McCormick uh, comes into this race well funded. Um, uh, you know, he built up a little bit of name recognition when he unsuccessfully ran for the uh, Republican nomination for Senate uh, two years ago. But I think some of that legwork helped him establish uh, name recognition. He's um, I, I think when you look at McCormick, what makes him interesting is is he has this sweet spot, if you will, I think, for Republicans in, in Pennsylvania. He doesn't draw the animosity of um the MAGA movement, the populist um, wing, the ascending part of the Republican Party led by President Trump uh, that might target him as a rhino. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at the same time, at the same time, he, he seems to have a little bit more appeal to, to moderates, you know, his background in finance, business, um, a little role in the Bush administration, um, I, I think makes him more comfortable for some voters that certainly haven't liked MAGA-esque um, candidates that have run in 2018 uh, and 2022 in Pennsylvania. So I expect this to be a really, really competitive race um, has a has a little bit of a gravitational pull on other races, including the Senate race. What are your expectations at the Senate race? Oh, I, I mean, Chris is exactly right. Um, uh, and said beautifully. Uh, it's, I hadn't really thought about that. Neither Casey uh, nor McCormick are polarizing figures in themselves, mm -hmm. right? And so that is, I think, going to profoundly affect the vote overall, right? Because then, if you are defaulting back to your partisanship, mm -hmm. uh, then you go to the polls and you're like, yeah, okay, you know, maybe... Maybe Biden is old, but also, you know, Casey's a, a solid citizen. And so mm -hmm. maybe I can I can do that. Um, I will be very curious after the fact, which is not what you asked, but I'm going to mm -hmm. say it anyway, uh, to see if there's a whole lot of ticket splitting, mm -hmm. um, which we did see in 2022. There was a tremendous amount of ticket splitting. Um, and so it's another thing that makes Pennsylvania great and also a bit of a riddle uh, wrapped up in a puzzle. Um, but both candidates, I think, are, are, you know, we've already seen a lot of ads, a lot of ads uh, from from Dave McCormick. And that's going to continue when when Casey begins, I think, to to really sort of gin up his campaign in a very aggressive way. And then the accusations of being a carpetbagger mm -hmm. and the fact, you know, he still lives in Connecticut, you know, kind of thing. Um, that's going to, I think, focus some of the attention. Um, but I think it's it's so interesting that right now in Pennsylvania, Trump is ahead by, I think, like 1.4 or something like that. But Casey's ahead by five points. Um, so certainly, you know, Chris, is, as always, is right. You know, double digit wins make five points look like, ooh, that's a nail biter. Uh, but compared to the top of the ticket, you know, that's I think if Joe Biden was up by five, he would be sleeping very, very well tonight. Chris, do you think coattails will have an impact this year? Here's that Chris's image. Uh, yeah, no, you, you already... know, Francine, it, it, oh. it might be the last from, you know, it's, it's, as I said, oh, are we having some tech issues? Oh, I think we have you back, Chris. Um, Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, I'm so sorry. A little bit of an internet uh, uh, issue. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's the lack of the coattails in some ways that I think is, is going to be uh, key. And I use the term gravitational pull, right? The, this race appears, the presidential race appears destined to be pretty close given past um, elections, given the, the candidates, given the polling. Um, and that doesn't allow, I think, for candidates necessarily, other candidates down ballot to break out on a statewide level on this, including Casey. Um, so, so, um, well, if, if if the presidential race wasn't here, it might have a different dynamic if that was the, the top of the ticket. So I don't know if if either Trump or Biden pull anybody away, but they'll certainly pull them, I think, towards the center as, as they they define the race. 
And for Casey um, and um, and McCormick is, can they craft some of those swing voters that Allison was talking about and, and create those? And there are those voters in Pennsylvania, Allison referred to, and it's really crucial. Uh, we see those in races. Um, 2022, right? Uh, uh, Governor Shapiro, uh, Josh Shapiro running at the time as the candidate uh, wins by 15 points. Um, at the same time, we see... Um, uh, uh, Fetterman only went by five points. So those had to be some some Oz Shapiro uh, voters in there. In 2020, just a key point, too, um, Republicans won statewide offices uh, for treasurer and auditor general at the same time that Joe Biden was winning the state and Josh Shapiro was winning another term as attorney general. Um, so swing voters are there. They're not gigantic in numbers, but they can absolutely uh, create. And could you see, would I be shocked if if Donald Trump won Pennsylvania and Bob Casey won and there was enough swing voters to do that? The answer is no. Before we run out of time, Chris, what congressional races are you targeting this time around? Oh, there, there's some great ones, uh, Francine, that I'm, I'm so interested in. Um, right here, as I mentioned before, in the 7th Congressional District, this is Susan Wilde, a Democrat, uh, seeking a fourth term in Congress. She's won some really narrow races this district is so competitive, uh, even got a little bit more competitive after the 2020 uh, census, um, changed the district a little bit, making it a, a slightly uh, more Republican leaning than it was in the past with the addition of Carbon uh, County. So the seventh district uh, with Wild going up against a state rep named Ryan McKenzie, who won the Republican nomination, uh, I imagine will be very competitive. Uh, the 8th Congressional District just north of here uh, in, in the Scranton area. This is Matt Cartwright's district, also a Democrat in a district that went Republican, uh, or at least for pre President Trump um, uh, in the last election. Uh, it was a little different district, but but largely uh, that should be competitive. And the 10th Congressional District um, down uh, in, in your area. It uh, looks absolutely fascinating. I know the Franklin and Marshall poll had it almost as a dead heat or, you know, statistical dead heat um, with uh, Representative Perry uh, trying to hold on to that district that's become a little more Democratic, leaning after the last redistricting. Um, and uh, 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 Janelle Stelson, who's uh, the, the Democratic nominee, has drawn some excitement with her name brand in the region as a, uh, an anchor woman. Um, those three districts uh, right there, I think, are going to be highly competitive and, and should have some impact nationally on who controls the House. Allison, what congressional reaches, races are you watching? Oh, Chris set them up and knocked them down. Um, you know, I think that uh, Susan Wilde, Matt Cartwright, both are in you know, Republican leaning districts. Um, the seventh is R plus two, the eighth is R plus four. Um, it's the Perry race that I am, I'm really fascinated by because what we saw in some of the polling is that Scott Perry's numbers went down after Trump's criminal conviction two weeks ago. So um, the effect that his very, very close association with Donald Trump has on his political future, I think is, is, really just one of the most interesting things out there. I'd like to thank my guests, Allison Dagnus, professor of political science at Shippensburg University, and Chris Bork, director of the Muhlenberg College Institute of Public Opinion. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. PCN's, PCN's Ellen Franz spoke with Representative Scott Conklin about his legislation that would allow pre-canvassing during Pennsylvania's elections. Welcome to our program. Your bill would allow pre-canvassing in Pennsylvania. Can you describe how this process works? Basically all pre-canvassing is, is that we've always had absentee voting. But as you know, a few years ago, we did no excuse absentee voting. Then with COVID, we made it that you could mail your absentee, your early absentee ballot in, or your early voting ballot in. All the pre-canvassing is, it allows the county to be able to begin to open up the first envelopes seven days before the election. And then they go in the, into the process and they're counted on election day, not before. Would this have any impact on the current election process in Pennsylvania? 
It would have a huge impact, and I'll, t and I'll tell you why. The County Commissioners Association, a few years ago, they were in Harrisburg, and myself as Sen and a couple senators were there. And we were going over the election fallacies and the truths. And, they, and I asked them point blank, if you had one wish, what would you want? They would want pre-canvassing to be able to open up those ballots. And the reason it makes a difference is, is then all those early ballots are counted on election day. See, as it is now, they have a few days afterwards they can count it. And by doing so, it allows I want to say devious people to use the process to their own political advantage, saying there's fraud and all those type of things. What this would do, it would clean up the system so on election night you don't have to worry about those early votes being counted days afterwards. They'd be voted and counted that day. How can election workers make sure that the ballots can be open and counted without impacting the security and safety of the election? There's one thing. I chaired the election board for many years. And I will tell you, those county election officials, every time they sit down, there's a Republican and a Democrat every time a ballot's moved. What this does, it gives them the, the ability. As of today, some counties count the ballots the day after the election. Other counties, such as center counties and other counties, will actually, at 7 a.m. in the morning, it's called a war room, they'll actually have individuals coming in Republicans and Democrats, and you all sit together, you open the ballots, you open up the envelopes, you put the ballots in a, ready to go in a pile, and then on election, uh, on election eve that night, they all go in the system first to be counted. What this does, it, it takes the same process, basically it's the same process that's used when it goes from the precinct to the county. It's just that they put it in the machines, the, the, the tallies taken along with the ballots itself back to the county. It's not as complicated as it sounds, but it is, it'll be more secure, the integrity will be there, the election workers who are honest will be there opening them up, getting them ready, and you'll know who the winner is that night. There are other states who already allow pre-canvassing in their election process. Did you look into them and how that has affected them when you did your research for this bill? You know, there's one thing I'll tell you as a legislator. Stealing an idea is much better than recreating an idea. <laughs> so this process, when we did it, we looked at the other states, how, how they've done it, everything from California to Florida to Maine to Massachusetts, whether they did it or not, we looked at the process. And the reason the bill is so simple is that we didn't want to get off on whether ID or signatures or anything. We wanted to do exactly what the professionals who do the elections do, and that's what they ask for, should I say. And they ask for to be able to get them in, in place to be counted immediately so the election workers aren't harassed, saying that they're trying to cheat one way or the other, which they do not. What kind of feedback have you heard from your colleagues in the House about this bill? Well, it depends on which side of the aisle you're on. <laughs> if you've pushed conspiracy theories since, since 2016, you uh, really, the, the, the last thing you want to do is to give the facts behind what's happening. The last thing you want to do is open the curtain and say, listen, there's no wizard. It's just some guy back there. The, the, the same way with the voting process. If you've run your whole political career over the last the, uh, couple cycles off conspiracy theories that aren't true, the last thing you want to be able to do is to be able to ruin your whole conspiracy theory. So basically what this does, and I'm not picking on anyone, but I am, this basically cleans it up. There's nothing different. We've been doing early voting in Pennsylvania for decades. All what this does is allow Republican and Democrats sit there, open up those ballots, get them in place starting seven days beforehand, so the public gets what they ask for, open, that they get the results, and our poll workers aren't harassed because these are your neighbors who come down, work for practically nothing or volunteer, and they work there every election cycle, and it's a sin that politicians who know better, they know, by the way, the only election they believe is fair is the one that they won that year. But, but I can tell the public right now, it is fair, it is done honestly, and all that this does is to help those election workers rather than having thousands on election day, they're able to get, it's like doing your work at home. You get it done early, your homework, and you're not, it's not all held up to the day of the test. This bill now goes to the Senate. Have you heard anything from the Senate at all regarding some feedback or their thoughts on this bill? It's it's a shame it's become a partisan issue. It really is. The County Commissioners Association is a nonpartisan group. They endorse this. In fact, there are more Republican counties in Pennsylvania than there are Democratic counties. My hope is, is that we can put our conspiracy theories off the side for one day. Listen to the people that do this election. Those are your counties. Those are the people that volunteer. Those are the people in your neighborhood. Those are the folks who are there all day long for almost no money whatsoever. Listen to them. Give them what they want. Pass this bill so the people know exactly who won on election night with all these, without all politicians standing up, with all these silly, unfounded conspiracy theories. And we just run off the facts. And the facts are this. 
If you go to the elections office any day after the election, you can ask for a list of everyone who voted their address and you can double check it. Everybody who says the everybody who says that the elections are fraud got that list and they know it's not true. They are being de- they are not being honest, it's deceptive. What this does, it takes away part of the deceptive practices. It puts a winner on election day, it gives the people what they want, makes it easier for the poll workers that they're able to get everything in place and it helps the system run smoothly. And that's all what this bill does. Representative Scott Conklin, thank you for your time. Thank you. That concludes today's show. Join us for another episode of the PCN Capital Preview. We'll discuss the state budget with former Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governors Mark Singel and Jim Cauley tomorrow's morning starting at 9 a.m. I'm Francine Scherzer. Thank you for watching.